Um, great. So I'm, uh, the plan today is to present uh, to you joint work with Alessandro Bonatti from MIT and Tan Gan, who is a graduate student at Yale. Um, I'm going to try to uh, move at a fairly rapid pace. This is all work in progress, uh, and so clearly uh, not much is settled here. But uh, what we're really interested in is, um, is trying to understand and study um, markets for information. Um, to this community, it's clear that these are uh, ever-expanding markets that, that grow in importance and that grow in, in volume. Um, and we want to think not just about sort of selling information as selling access to a database, um, as, for example, using um, a terminal from Bloomberg that gives you information about um, a particular financial data, but we want to think about it as really providing information uh, that is embedded in predictions and rating recommendations and all kinds of customized and personalized settings, okay? Um, these markets provide huge opportunities, but also challenges because um, there clearly is in the sense in which uh, many of these intermediaries information markets are rather large. That creates questions of market powers. It creates questions of uh, distortion in information market, but also in markets beyond information markets. There are issues of privacy attached to it. Um, in particular, if you think about the, the rise of the large internet platforms, uh, then clearly this had led over the last past decade to an unprecedented collection of uh, individual data, and we are sort of start wanting to understand how is this information traded, what is the value and the price of this data, and what are some of the implications uh, for the downstream interaction between firms and consumers. That, that's the basic topic. To just give you um, a few um, pictures, um, and visualizations that just uh, highlight the importance of the data collection. So the next two graphs are just um, uh, coming from courtesy of the Privacy Lab at the Yale Law School. Um, so that's simply um, coming from a report that's trying to measure um, how much tracking information is on the apps in the Android environment and trying to collect information and then transmit it further down to, to Google, Facebook, and, and third-party intermediaries. And what you find is that many of these apps really uh, transmit a lot of information and, um, and, um, and that transmission of information is ongoing that is um, on the right-hand axis here, you see sort of where the original information is being generated and then how it is being forwarded to other data intermediaries in particular, um, sort of strictly databases like Axiom or credit rating, uh, credit, ra credit rating agency like Experience and so on. That is basically combining information. Um, the particular emphasis that we want to uh, give today is that um, the individual level data really um, helps, of course, on the one hand side to create surplus and create better matching. But the central feature that uh, we want to understand a little bit better is that the individual data is really uh, social data. That is, uh, the data about any particular individual is not only interesting because it tells us about the individual, but in particular it tells us something about uh, individuals like him. Okay? And to the extent that that is true, um, the, the collection of data basically leads to an informational externality at a very large scale. And with this informational externality comes, of course, the possibility um, that there's a gap between uh, private efficiency and social efficiency. And we want to trace out a little bit how big this gap can be and what are some of the implications are. Um, so today I want to basically give you a few results of how the possession and the acquisition of this individual data will affect um, the trade-offs and the, uh, the, the terms of trade between consumers, advertisers, and the data intermediaries, and want to understand a little bit how the social dimension of their data magnifies, in some sense, the value or the impact that the collection of the individual data has. Okay? Um, when we want to think about information today, we want to think not just about the direct sale of information. So here's an example that Equifest, for example, is allowing advertisers to access information about the credit worthiness or the level of spending that is predicted by consumers. Uh, but more importantly, we think about the indirect sale of information uh, that is happening all the time, say, in sponsored search or in many other areas where basically, if you, for example, think about the search on Google or Amazon, um, what is being then offered to the advertisers 
is a bundle, namely of uh, a consumer and particular characteristics that the advertiser specified that it wants to reach. So we're not selling just a list of interested clients, but we're basically combining um, individual data with specific characteristics that the advertisers are interested in. And this indirect sale of information is much larger and much more important than along many dimensions, and it basically leads sort of um, to behavioral predictions uh, that we want to attain. So think about, you know, uh, any mapping software that basically makes recommendation what to do in terms of um, where to go for lunch, where to stay overnight, and so on. Okay. Um, clearly, advertising, display advertising is another form of indirect sale of information. Okay. Um, the opportunities are clearly many. Uh, we can create better matches, we can create more value. Um, the challenges are also many uh, in the sense that uh, clearly it helps uh, advertisers or intermediary to extract more surplus from the consumers. Um, one can leverage information that comes from many consumers to correlation in the preferences. If one has not only online but offline data, then we can augment that information. If one has ideas about the network structure, then that's helpful to uh, basically assess the value of information. Okay? It leads uh, to many open questions that really we are just starting to formulate, and that um, is true both, I think, for computer science as well as for economics and related disciplines. How should the brokers and platforms compensate com uh, consumers for the information that they provide? Uh, what determines ultimately the equilibrium price of information? What should we expect about the market structure in these information markets? Should we think these are basically atomistic small providers, or will there be always a few large uh, uh, intermediaries prevail? And, and what are the implications for competition policy? Clearly, we know that um, there's a lot of interesting debate going on right now about what is the use of information, both in Europe but increasingly also in the US. Okay. Um, so today, the model that I'm going to present you shortly um, relies on three recent papers that Alessandro and I have written. Um, there's, um, I should point out, a very important early work by Martin Fleiderer on uh, how to price information for the purposes of financial market. This is really, uh, really classic work, and recently, both in the computer science and economics, there's work on how to price information that approaches it from a mechanism design point of view. Okay? Graphically or visually, um, the this kind of scenarios institutions that we're interested in is basically represented by this um, triangle here where we think uh, underlying is an interaction between the consumers and the firms um, that generates the the social value uh, the data intermediaries basically serve to both create the match but also determine the trades or the terms of trade between uh, consumer and firm okay so uh, the data intermediaries collect information in exchange they provide services or monetary payments to uh, the consumers and then they hand on this information to the firms, to the advertisers uh, and try to extract the compensation from the firms. This can take on many forms, so if you think about um, search, so think about Google for example, on the search engine then clearly this is um, the consumers trying to get some information on the search engine, then that result is basically uh, forwarded to the uh, position auction uh, to the advertisers. Okay? Um, it can take a more complicated structure in the sense that uh, consumers might interact on apps, um, generate information there, that information is then forwarded to agreements between the app and Facebook, uh, Facebook is then trying to monetize it by uh, selling advertising on these markets. Okay? Today, the, the basic model that I want to present you and, and give you sort of some, uh, some few initial results is one where um, we want to think about the data intermediary, a single data intermediary that holds all the information. So maybe classically speaking, think about Axiom or Experian um, that collects information from the consumers and is even willing to pay them for that information and then turns around and sells this information to the firms who in turn uses to price discriminate to basically um, offer different um, prices to different segments where the segmentation is happening endogenously based on the information that the firms received from, uh, from the data intermediary. 
that is the setting that I want to study on the basis of which I want to get some first insights into the organization of markets, into the price of information. Yes? Uh, single price per segment per information that they have. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, so good. Let me uh, at least give you an idea of the model and um, then go through it. So we want to think about a single data broker, which is basically uh, intermediating between the consumer and the firm. Uh, they're end consumers, they're collecting the information, and then there's a monopolist seller who's trying to use that information uh, to choose a more sophisticated pricing policy. Uh, each consumer has a type or willingness to pay for the object, and that willingness to pay is simply the sum of a uh, common shock, that is uh, something that is common in the population, uh, and then an idiosyncratic shock, something that's idiosyncratic to him. So that's reflect our idea that individual data presents uh, social data in the sense that the valuation of the consumer is both informative about his idiosyncratic shock, but also about this common shock. And the more we know about consumer I, the more we can infer about the valuation of consumer J. Okay? The consumer simply has a linear quadratic um, objective function, that is, he wants to maximize his consumption minus the price he has to pay for the, uh, for the choice of quantity he's acting. And the, the seller is simply setting a single price for every segment and wants to maximize the revenue it can achieve from the consumer. So it's uh, the underlying interaction between the consumer and the firm is very simple. It's simply a price discrimination problem. Um, it will become more interesting when we think about the role that the intermediaries play. Okay? In order to soon think about uh, the social data aspect, uh, we're going to today just talk about a um, normally distributed environment, that is the valuation of the consumer is normally distributed. Coming in, he's a little bit uncertain about this valuation is. This valuation is subject to an aggregate and idiosyncratic shock. Okay? Um, and when the firm or the intermediary then passes on the information to the, con uh, to the firm, then it can choose to just pass on the information as it is, or it can choose to noise it up, that is, convey less information. Okay? So it has a, basically a choice both in terms of how it prices the information, but also on how accurate the information is that it's providing to the firm. Okay? Okay. So, the timing is very simple. The data broker commits to an information structure. Um, he offers payments to the consumer uh, to receive the information and in turn asks the firm to pay a lump sum fee for the information that he's providing. Okay. They accept the offers or reject the offers and then uh, receive some private information that they pass on to the intermediary uh, and that's then passed on modified if possible, that it's noisied up if possible, conveying less information if um, appropriate, and on the basis of that information, the firm can then ask for a price that uses, um, basically tailors the price to the segment. Okay? All right, so um, let me just emphasize the social aspect of, of the data, that is, Every data point that I'm gathering from the consumer will tell us something about his willingness to pay, his type. Okay? Um, but because of the common nature of the data, it is also true that it will tell us something about the expected willingness to pay of the other consumers. Okay? And that is what's created the informational externality. That's even if I'm anticipating that the information that I'm forwarding to the intermediary, say to the credit rating agency, will have some impact on my resulting net utility, I will not and cannot be compensated for uh, the value that this information has in the pricing vis-a-vis -a, -vis a third consumer, Jay. Okay? Uh, so I'm not getting compensated, nor is that other consumer compensated for the additional exposure uh, that he's going to face given that the information is being collected and the information uh, displays some correlation. Okay? And, that, and that's uh, really the source of the externality. Okay? It's, if you wish, a positive externality in the sense that we're providing more and more information, but of course in the marketplace, uh, because of the pricing, uh, this might well turn into a negative externality, negative exposure by the consumers, and that's what we're trying um, to, to do, to investigate. Okay, so the, the pricing problem for the uh, firm then is very simple. Um, he, 
he knows that the, the firm is simply going to set a price P that will lead to some consumption. This is a linear quadratic framework, this is entirely standard. And what the firm is trying to do is for every information uh, that it has is trying to find the optimal price. Okay. Um, how is information and surplus related to each other is the first question we want to ask. Okay. We can, for a given information structure, compute what the consumer surplus is. And that has uh, two very natural components. One is the covariance between the willingness to pay and the price. Okay. If that covariance is high, then that of course means that the price will respond to a high willingness to pay for the object, which is a, a bad thing from the point of the consumer because it basically tells us that we're going to extract the surplus. Okay. Um, so that's as the source for the need to be compensated for the information that I'm forwarding as consumer to the information intermediary. Okay. Okay, and, and that's precisely what the consumer is going to ask for. Okay. Um, good. Now, will there be actually information transition equilibrium? And what's the nature of the information that is being traded between the consumer and the intermediary? Okay, that, that's the main question here. If we start out with one single consumer, then we actually find out that um, there will not be any scope for information transmission because this is a classic problem of third degree price discrimination where actually it is harmful for the consumer to forward the information because it will largely be used to extract more surplus without creating a sufficient amount of additional value. Okay? So if I'm just trying to get information about the idiosyncratic preference of the consumer and then pass that forward to the firm, then under no circumstances and under no informational policy can I create a, a valuable market for information. Okay? But the thing changes very dramatically, and that's the basic logic uh, that is, um, was actually formulated originally by, by John Robinson in 1933 already about um, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, um, the negative effects of price discrimination on consumer welfare as well as social what is interesting is that this changes rapidly when we have more than one consumers and when we are becoming aware of the information externality that is in play between the consumers. So I'm going to present you one main result on when there will be profitable intermediation, when there will be scope for a data intermediary to actually pass on the information, even though the consumers fully anticipate the damages that the information does to them. And then I'm going to uh, think about what happens when markets become large, that is when there are many consumers. And I want then to think about what happens when the uh, firms or the intermediary offer many services, many ways to source information. Okay. So the first result is that um, we can actually have information uh, transmission if and only if a particular ratio or a particular uh, relation inequality satisfies and that is saying uh, if it's the case that the size of the aggregate shock about what we're trying to learn times the number of buyers in the market is large enough to outweigh the idiosyncratic information then there is scope for information division. and the idea here is simply to say if that product between the number of consumers and the aggregate shock is large enough, okay, and clearly it will always be large enough if we choose n to be large enough, then the informational externality is strong enough that we can basically just pass on the aggregate information. We actually need to compensate the consumer very little um, and we will have scope for information acquisition. Okay? In terms of how much information should the data intermediary optimal provide, uh, we can show that you never would want to add a idiosyncratic noise, but that it will be profitable for him to actually not forward all the information, but just offer a noisy version of the information that he has collected. Okay, so there will be some residual privacy as part of the optimal information structure. Okay. Um, so, so here's a plot of that, right? So if I'm thinking. Uh, on the right-hand axis, I let the individual source of variance, the sigma theta i, grow. Okay. How much noise do I need to inject to have profitable trade-off information? And 
when the idiosyncratic, no in the idiosyncratic variation is large, then I need more noise because I basically want to uh, suppress the individual exposure of the consumers to surplus extraction. Okay. Good. Now, two um, natural questions to ask in the setting is what happens if we have more and more consumers. Okay. So here we see the power of information um, coming through. Let's think about FI as the individual consumer compensation that the consumer gets uh, for forwarding his information to the intermediary. And let's call G the brokers or the intermediary revenues. Okay? Then what we find is, holding everything else constant, is that the per capita revenue that the broker is generating is actually increasing in the number of consumers because informational externality is becoming large. Okay? Um, and in fact, his profits, as there are many uh, consumers, eventually grows linear in N. Okay? By contrast, the actual compensation that the firm has to provide to the aggregate of the consumers, that is converging against a finite number. Okay? So that basically means that when we have many consumers, the individual compensation will eventually will go to zero. Okay? So that might give you some indication why often, um, think about you know, Facebook or Google, um, there's actually no compensation at all, uh, and maybe little compensation in terms of services, but, but nothing um, in terms of a monetary reward for the information that you provide. Okay? Um, so here's just a plot um, of the consumer compensation is large, if in some sense there are few consumers and therefore the externality is not working uh, very well, but as soon as there are many consumers, the externality is becoming so strong that actually the compensation declines, the total compensation declines, but of course the information that the intermediary is gathering is increasing all the time. Okay? So the, the value of information uh, keeps on increasing. Okay? And, and that's then reflected uh, in the data broker's profits, which grows linearly in N. Uh, that is, uh, every additional piece of information helps both in terms of allowing a sharper estimate, but also helps in terms of selling that service to the firm who just has one more consumer to which it can tailor its product and its price. Okay? So, so that shows you in some sense um, um, the, the, is the almost increasing or at least uh, linear returns of scale for information uh, without much bounds. Okay? Um, so that was what happens when we have more and more consumer and the informational externality is becoming stronger in that sense. The second question is we could ask what happens if we have more and more sources about information about the individual consumers, right? So if you think about um, many of these platforms are offering an increasing number of services, each one of them is basically ad allowing the platform to gather additional information uh, think about mapping services, think about email services, think about um, you know, YouTubes and so on, uh, think about Facebook, various services. These are all uh, ways to elicit in some sense more and more information and we want to know what happens to, to, to the revenue and to the, um, to the ability of the intermediary to benefit from this increase in information. Okay? Right? So, one way to formalize this is to say, uh, basically, each additional source J um, gives us another possibly independent, possibly correlated uh, piece of information about the willingness to pay of the consumer. Okay? It clearly allows us to improve the estimate about the willingness to pay that the consumer has, and therefore allows us to forward more information to the downstream firm. Okay? Um, what are the effects of this? Well, uh, we might want to say what happens if we can offer more and more services. So let X be the number of services or the number of sources of information that allow me to gather information about the preference of consumers. What we find is that the more sources I have, uh, the less uh, noising up, the less privacy I need to guarantee. Um, and again, the broker's profits, the intermediary profits, are actually convex in a number of resources. So that tells us the more services we provide, um, the better is the information in some sense interacting in terms of providing, um, uh, providing information about the, the willingness to pay of the consumer. Okay? Um, 
let me sort of think about two or three um, extensions that are, that are naturally to think about is when I now um, thought about the interaction at the downstream between the consumer and the firm. I focused intentionally on price discrimination, uh, intentionally because in the absence of intermediation, um, there was no scope of um, forwarding the information, okay, but in the presence of the externality there is. Um, now, this is of course just one particular way of using the information. There are other ways in which I can use information or the firm could use information. For example, um, it may want to match its service optimally to um, the preferences of the consumers, right? So in that sense, the consumer now clearly would want to convey that information much more straightforwardly because it just helps the matching. It's, he's not so much concerned about the surplus extraction, okay? So think about now, uh, they're not just being one firm downstream, but many firm downstreams, all with the individually different objective, okay? Some of them maybe want to use information to price discriminate, others to allow them to better match uh, the product and the preferences of the consumers, okay? Um, in that environment, clearly, um, there are different motifs and, and different ways to evaluate what should be the optimal passage of information, what's the socially informational, the socially efficient way to pass on the information. But what is clear, um, is that it will rarely be uh, the case that the market will naturally lead to a first best allocation because the objectives of the individual firms um, clearly don't match up to, um, to the social welfare. Okay? Um, so uh, even though uh, to some firms I may want to actually give all of the information, even from a social point of view, in the overall, uh, it's clear that the total allocation will typically not be first best. So there are concerns regarding the social efficiency of these information markets. Okay. Um, in the model that I described to you and its result, we clearly used uh, monetary compensation for the information. Uh, but likewise, you can think about sort of what often has been described as a barter economy, namely where um, we're not exchanging information for money, but we're exchanging information for services, okay? Um, all I have said so far uh, can be simply translated because if you just think about what is the monetary equivalent of the services, then the presence of the information externality basically allows the firms to provide services that are on average below the value of the information that the consumer passes on to the intermediary. Okay. Uh, this then leads to many interesting questions regarding uh, the industrial structure or the market structure um, of these information intermediaries or information uh, brokers um, that might be interesting um, to study. Okay. Finally, um, I, I did discuss um, a single intermediary, uh, and it's natural to think about uh, there being many intermediaries, and you could think about would the informational externality um, go away or be weakened or be of less importance when we not have a single intermediary, uh, but in fact competing intermediaries, right? Uh, and here, um, the results that we currently have are um, showing that while competition will help a little bit, um, perhaps will provide larger uh, privacy under some circumstances, uh, it typically will not resolve the problem. It will not return us uh, to a first best um, social efficient outcome. Okay, so let me just give you uh, one such result. So, so now let's think about not just being one information broker, but two information brokers. They are competing, um, and of course they compete uh, they could compete either in single homing, right? So think about operating system, those are typically single homing. Think about search engines, clearly I can use many engines if I want. I could search for product on Amazon, I could search for projects on Google, okay? Um, but, but the result is that um, given, the, given the nature of the information, um, when you have single homing and the nature of the information externality, typically it will be the case that all consumer will just to sell to one broker. Even though we're allowing for competition, because of the information externality, the firm that has the larger 
base will be able to offer more favorable prices to the individual consumers because in some sense he is exposing the individual consumers to less of an information externality. Much of the information has been gathered already, so the, uh, the damage that is being done is less. Okay? Um, with multi-homing, it will be the case that typically consumers will be able to sell to all of the brokers, but it will not change the total amount of information that is being passed along. Okay? So, so one such um, result is here for the case of the single homing consumers. Okay? So if um, the idiosyncratic information is small relatively to the common information, so that is we have a substantial amount of social externality, then one can show that there is, exists, in fact, a unique pure strategy equilibrium in which one of the firm takes over the entire industry, uh, whereas the other firm is trying to compete, is trying to compete on favorable terms with respect to privacy, but it just can't offer the right compensation that would be necessary to move the consumer from the large firm to the small firm. Okay. Um, even though uh, we're basically now collecting all the information in one firm, even though we offer competition, there's some effect in terms of the privacy which is given to the individual consumer. So in a competitive environment, uh, this is the picture here, um, the, the firm that provides all of the information will introduce more noise in this institution to the firm that is, will grant a higher level of privacy typically than it would do in the absence of a competition. So there's some ameliorating attenuating effect, uh, but that's not enough to, to basically get us to um, a first best. Okay, so um, that's sort of a, a quick introduction um, of how we can think about um, and formulate some of the important issues uh, in an increasing market space where information is traded, uh, where there's sort of a large infrastructure being built up to, to pass and evaluate individual level data, social level data, aggregate data. Um, what I hope to convince you is that uh, there's naturally a tendency uh, for large intermediaries to rise in this market and that the revenue of those are typically increasing faster than linear or at least linear. Uh, both in terms of the number of services that they're providing and also in the customer base that they have access to. Okay. Um, competition, early analysis indicates, doesn't really address and help uh, solve this problem. And so uh, that lets us to think about uh, what are the implications for thinking about the market structure, uh, for regulation possibly uh, in this intermediation sector, in the sector for, uh, for trading of information. Um, I will now invite uh, Yiling Chen, professor of computer science at Harvard, to come discuss this talk for us. So I'm going to um, have some high-level discussion about Dirk's uh, talk. Um, so, so this is a, a quote from um, an Israeli author who wrote a New York Times bestseller book. And uh, the quote basically says that Oh, if you get something for free, you should know that you are the product. So, so this is very puzzling that um, we're giving out valuable information all the time. So since data is so valuable, why we always subject ourselves as the product? So I think uh, Dirk's talk uh, answers many questions related to a data marketplace. But the one intuition I really want to highlight is that it uses a very simple model, explains this phenomenon. So why the value of data is so high, but the data holders who are contributing the data basically contribute the data for free, all receiving a very low compensation, where compensation is very broadly defined. Uh, so let me just try to uh, reconstruct a part of Dirk's model at a very high level. Uh, so basically the model is thinking about uh, a marketing application. So there is a firm who's trying to sell a product. Um, let's say that this product is an energy drink. Uh, 
Um, and the firm needs to decide uh, a price for this product. And on the other hand, there are consumers. There are also data holders. And each consumer essentially have a linear demand function. So I'm really abstracting from uh, Dirk's model here. And this linear demand function depends on the type of the consumer, which basically is TI. That represents the consumer's value for the first unit of the product. So if there's only one consumer, and somehow the consumer is sending some signals related to his type to an intermediary, and then the intermediary can pass that information to the firm, so we know that these are going to hurt the consumer because the firm may charge a price to maximize his profit, and that creates a decreasing of the surplus in the consumer. So in order for the consumer to be willing to share this information, the consumer must be compensated by the differential surplus. So, so I'm going to be hurt due to the price. So if you want me to share the information, at least I need to be compensated by that difference. So this is really just an individual rationality constraint or participation constraint for the data holder to be willing to share the data. So this seems to be quite uh, reasonable for the single green person. And since the right person below doesn't share any data, so the right person probably shouldn't be compensated. But sometimes the consumer's preferences are correlated. And this is exactly the model uh, that Dirk tried to capture. So suppose that the valuation of the consumers are actually correlated. So the correlation is con constructed using a common component theta, so which is normally distributed uh, with a mean and a certain variance. And then each consumer's type also has an idiosyncratic component that is theta i. So the variance of the theta part essentially tells us how correlated the individual's preferences are. Um, and notice that with correlated preferences, so if the green person reveals his data to the intermediary and receives compensation, this actually creates a negative externality to the right person if the right person also going to purchase the product from this firm. Even if the right person doesn't review his information at all. So this is essentially the reason why when individuals are contributing data, they get very low compensation. So think about the scenario that the intermediary already have a lot of people agree to contribute their data. And I'm the great person. I'm thinking about whether I should contribute my data. So if I'm contributing my data, the differential surplus actually at this point is very small because uh, the intermediary already has a large amount of the data. And since preferences are correlated, that large amount of data makes a good prediction for the average or the mean valuation of the population already. So even if I'm going to contribute my data, that's not going to change that valuation very much. Okay? So what's really happening is that the value of a large data set is very large. And this is the value that the intermediary can extract from the firm in this setting. But what the intermediary needs to pay to the data holders, to the consumers, is only their differential surplus. And as the number of other people who are willing to contributing increases, that differential surplus is very small and diminishing with the number of the uh, data holders who are sharing their information. So as you can see that uh, the left-hand side is the value that, or the revenue that the intermediary can extract from, from the firm. And summation of the right-hand side is what the intermediary needs to pay to the data holders to get the data at the first point. So the intermediary has the market power and gets most of the profit from intermediating the data transfer process. 
So, and the simple model allows um, Dirk to analyze uh, how much correlation of the preferences to make the intermediary to be profitable and what's the optimal way for the intermediary to decide how much noise to add before transferring the data to the uh, firm. Okay, so there are a lot of other results in Dirk's talk, but that is the one that I really want to highlight because I think that essentially explains, oh, we have to consider the externality of individual data because it's not like that revealing my data doesn't impact you. Actually revealing my data impacts you a lot. Um, but probably the better way to say is that if ever one of you reveal your data, that going to have a very big impact on me. Um, so that's very complicated. So it's almost asking the question that since the intermediary has a lot of market power and seems to extract most of the surplus uh, in this whole process, um, and while the data holders are the ones who contributing the data, they're not compensated much. So is that a fair outcome? So how should the value generated by the data be distributed to the multiple parties? And it also has a related question is that, oh, what type of intermediaries do we really need? Uh, since we have observed that a profit maximizing intermediary are going to have a very large market power and that's may not what we want. And then should we form other types of intermediaries to return more value to the data holders? Um, and I think this is something that uh, Dirk briefly mentioned in his talk already. So, so the model talk about informational externality as a result of a single data holder transferring his data to the intermediary has an externality to other data holder. So that's the left hand side. Um, but when we have multiple data users, so because remember that, oh, it's costless to generate another copy of data. So there's basically infinite amount of supply of data and I can sell my data to one data user. I can also sell my data to multiple data user. And if there are two companies both selling uh, energy drinks, then they're essentially competing on information and there is an externality on the data user side too. So if I consider externality on the data user side, um, how does price of data work and what's the optimal way for us to think about uh, surplus and allocating the value contributed uh, are generated by data. Okay. Um, this is also related to a question of what should we sell? So we know that we're collecting data. So uh, we could choose to sell data, um, but data can be easily replicable. If I sell my data to you, you probably can sell that again after you have finished using it. Um, and also with competing firms, maybe the firms cares about uh, exclusive use of the data. So maybe we can sell licenses of data. Um, and in that case, uh, we do not directly sell the data itself. We're selling licenses to access or the use of the data and maybe having a limited quantity. And there's also some work, actually one of the papers in this morning's uh, data marketplace sessions is kind of along this line. So, so data can be repeatedly used for multiple tasks. So if you think about your running machine learning algorithms on the data, um, so the data can be used for multiple algorithms. So do we have to sell the data to the company who then run their own algorithms? Or we could just say that, give me your algorithm, I'll allow you to run the algorithm on the data, and then I'm going to tell you what's the outcome. So that is considered to be, can we sell the insights that one can get from the data? Oh, if we think about even further along this line, we don't really have to sell the data. And especially if we think about the data intermediary has a reason to actually collect a profit, then maybe we can sell models. So uh, Google is very good at 
using and figuring out what's the optimal machine learning algorithm to use on a data set um, much better than what I can do. So if I have a problem, maybe I can just describe the problem and give that to the intermediary, and the intermediary who has access to the data can actually pick a best model for my problem and then give me not only the insight, but also the model to use for my problem. So that's a lot to think about, uh, and this is like uh, kind of unique to thinking about data, because when we talk about physical goods, we either sell the physical goods or sell like a divisible part of it, but when we're selling data, it seems that there's different level of knowledge that we can sell. Uh, and the next thing I want to mention about in this whole uh, ecosystem of data is that, um, so sometimes there are multiple data users. They may not directly have an impact to the utility of the data holders. It could be just the companies are running algorithms, or they have some statistical model that they want to estimate, or researchers who's carrying out their research. And so algorithms and statistical models have focused a lot to achieve a good performance, but that's all under the assumption that uh, we have a representative sample of the data. So if we're thinking about that people can treat data, or compensating users for providing their data, so there is the question about whether this process are going to create a biased set of data. And if that creates a biased set of data, that's going to affect the subsequent algorithms and statistical estimation uh, that requires like, us to rethink about what's the best algorithm and what, what are the best statistical procedures when we're dealing of data generated through a data marketplace. Okay, uh, and the last thing that I want to mention is privacy. And I put it the last because this is probably the, the first thing this community will think about when people talk about a data marketplace. Uh, and indeed, there are uh, quite some work that's already trying to address that. Uh, so when people are trying to sell their data, um, but the data holders care about their privacy, um, what's the best way to price the data such that we can preserve the privacy? And usually the community takes a differential privacy approach. So adding noises to make sure that, um, so changing one individual's data uh, is not going to affect the outcome significantly. But if we look at uh, Dirk's model when the preferences are correlated, so it is pretty good with respect to uh, the differential privacy perspective because whether have my own data contributed or not, are not going to really change the price that much because given everyone else's data, uh, the firm can already have a good estimation of the demand of the consumers. So in that sense, each individual are not going to affect the outcome very much. And from a differential privacy perspective, that seems to be good. And probably it doesn't really need a lot of noise to be added. But this certainly seems to be problematic because Given all the data, um, the firm learns a lot of things about the valuation of all the individuals. So how should we think about the economics, the value of the data together with privacy, especially when there's um, the social data consideration, when preferences of data are correlated? Um, so I'm sure there are many other interesting problems. Um, this is a very new area. And I think it really requires um, multidisciplinary investigation and thinking. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to invite Dirk back up to uh, uh, respond to the uh, discussion. And um, you guys can ask some questions of the two speakers as well. Can you do it with the mic? Because we have people yeah, remotely, well, actually. Yeah, thank you to Elaine for the discussion. And um, that was very nice. Thank you. Um, so it gives me a lot of things to think about. But uh, well, I think then I'll see you next week. So thank you. Okay, great. So questions from the audience. Uh, Ilya? Yeah. 
Um, right. Um, so the question, you know, so, so, maybe yeah. you could summarize the question. Okay. Um, I'm not sure whether I can because um, I guess it has many directions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. Good. Um, so the the um, so um, what I, you know. Uh, so the question that Ilya was posing is. Um, why perhaps in light of um, the model don't we see more price discrimination? And why wouldn't people anticipate that? Yes. Not uh, stop the way that they would think that they wouldn't want price discrimination. Right. Um, so I think uh, while we, we, we did allow for, I mean, while we uh, explicitly allowed for price discrimination, uh, we allowed it at the group level where we basically collected the information and then offered a uniform price for the group. And so actually at that level, uh, it does not appear to be a price discrimination. That is, everybody in this entire large group got the same price. It's just that the firms were able to adjust the price to the demand condition that prevailed. And so I think that is something that happens um, quite frequently. In fact, the first result that I gave you uh, about the impossibility of a trading of information with just one consumer, I think, hinted at the fact that individual price discrimination is probably unlikely to uh, be observed very commonly because it's clear that it's going to go against the interests of the individual consumers. And I think, you know, companies have made that experience, I guess, most famously Amazon, which tried to, to tailor to individual consumers and then very quickly withdrew that. So I think in the way it appeared in the model here, price discrimination was actually not being detectable, except that the prices fluctuated perhaps a, little, a lot over time, over locations. And, uh, but, but I think that does indeed happen, and it happens actually more and more frequently, I would argue. Um, All right, uh, Scott? Yeah, I think that's right. That's the correct summary, I think. Yep. Other questions? Okay, let's thank everybody, and uh, there's a coffee break outside.